Good day. I bid thee welcome to the newest of the newest of Life in Jaws. Assuming you're watching this at the release date. <clears throat> Today we're looking at a project you haven't seen in forever. Well, three years at least. The big airtight native terrarium. Big because it's big. Airtight because there's no gas exchange with the outside world meaning that oxygen, carbon dioxide, but also food and water are all self-sufficient in this ecosystem and native because everything in the jar was collected locally. About three years ago I made a video in which I made this terrarium and a month later I posted an update. For whatever reason I never really showed this project anymore. At all. Until now. If you haven't already, you can watch those previous two videos, but I'll give a quick recap now. In April 2021, so almost three years ago, I went outside to gather. I got this plant, but it immediately died, so whatever. A bunch of soil, which definitely already had all kinds of creatures and seeds in it, some sticks and stones, bark, and of course a whole bunch of animals, including an awesome centipede, a bunch of roly-polies, a pretty beetle, an earthworm and some common striped wood lice. Next I put it all together in a big jar, while adding some plants like the whatever plant, grass, a creeping charlie, sedum acre or goldmoss stonecrop, a millipede I found in the bucket and also some common rough wood lice. There also turned out to be a small harvestman, a very well camouflaged jumping spider, a large amount of springtails and a young white-lipped snail all roaming around in there. This is what it looked like. A little over a month later, the plants had grown tremendously and the jar now looked like this. The common striped wood lice were showing themselves more often. Very exciting to me was the fact that the springtails had reproduced. As you know, I'm a big springtail fan. Not just because they're very cute, but also because they play an important role in the ecosystem. But we'll get to that later. There were also some nematodes present on the glass, which were enjoying the moist conditions. The most noticeable grower was the creeping charlie, which spread all around the jar, which is the thing this species does, spread. The sedum acre had grown really tall and was even flowering. A fun detail is that the newly grown leaves were less succulous due to the high moisture content in the soil. A mystery plant had grown to the top of the jar and the whatever plant was now dead. Whatever. A nice surprise was to see clover growing. The grass was also spreading throughout the jar and flowering. There were even plants growing beneath the soil, right next to the glass. The millipede decided to give us a nice little show. Even cooler was to see this large rove beetle, probably a devil's coach horse beetle. A big, bad and bold predator, preying on all the animals in this jar, except maybe for the centipede. Mid-June 2021 was when I actually closed it for realsies, so nearly three years ago. And this was the last you ever saw of this jar. Until now. I did film something in between, but not a whole lot, so here we go. In November 2021, most plants, except for the Creeping Charlie, had died. I agree, it doesn't look great. The snail had grown quite a bit, and so did the population of the rough wood lice, as can be seen by all the young and bebe isopods. Look, look, it's a springtail. This larger isopod is doing a bit of a balancing act. A whole year later I filmed this, 
four or five isopods eating rotting leaf soup from the glass of the jar. And that was it. Until March 2K24. So, this is what it looks like now, about three years after it was made and airtight for nearly three years. It hasn't really changed in appearance for the last two years. The Creeping Charlie is still spread throughout the entire jar. You've heard the name Creeping Charlie a few times now, but what is it? Well, it's a creeping, as the name suggests, evergreen plant in the mint family. You might also know it as ground ivy, gill over the ground, ale hoof, tun hoof, cat's foot, field balm or runaway robin. In Dutch we call it Holmstraf. Scientifically it's known as Glecoma hedracea, but also as Nepeta glecoma and Nepeta hedracea. Confusing. Other than some moss and algae, all other plants have died. This could be due to a number of reasons, but why have the creeping Charlie specifically survived and even thrived for so long? Well, creeping Charlie does really well in very moist soil. And as you couldn't have missed, the soil and the entirety of this jar is quite wet. Too moist for many other plants. Furthermore, since this jar is usually standing on a windowsill facing north-northeast, this means it's almost always in the shade. Creeping Charlie is a plant that does really well in the shade, while many other plants, like the grass and the gold moss stone crop, really require a lot of sun to grow well. When this jar does receive a lot of sunlight in the morning, the Creeping Charlie doesn't really mind, as it can also do quite well in sunny environments. As far as I know, but correct me if I'm wrong, this plant is also the only one planted in this jar that is often regarded as an unwanted weed, due to the many different conditions in which it can thrive. Okay, so that's why the Creeping Charlie is the only plant left in this closed terrarium, or at least, that is my hypothesis. But all those other plants that died, didn't they cause any problems for the ecosystem by dying? Any large fungal blooms, or toxic gases, or anything in that matter? No, they didn't. And that is because almost all animal life in this jar is detritivorous. A detritivore is an organism that gets its nutrients by consuming decomposing organic matter. In this case, decomposing plants. In this jar we have many springtails which are the best, and are also great detritivores. There's also many wood lice, again fantastic detritivores, and then there's the millipedes, which once again are detritivores. What we also have quite a lot of in this jar are nematodes. They are those white wiggly worms. There exist a lot of different nematode species. Some of those are also detritivores. I have no clue what species this particular nematode is, or if it even is only one species. Therefore, I couldn't tell you whether or not these nematodes are also detritivores. What I can tell you is that they probably aren't, because detritivorous nematodes are a minority in the phylum of nematoda. Many are parasitic, but our nematodes are most likely feeding on microbes living in the moisture on the glass, plants and soil, which in turn are also feeding on decaying plants, or on each other. The microscopic scale is truly a chaotic one. So, all our detritivorous friends are keeping their home clean by eating the dead and dying plants, thereby preventing any nasty situations. When fungus does grow, springtails and isopods don't mind eating it usually. Apparently, the creeping Charlie has grown steadily enough and died steadily enough to be able to maintain the population of all the animals we've seen so far for the last three years and presumably for many generations. The animals and many microbes in this jar are breathing oxygen provided by the plants and some algae and bacteria in this jar. In turn, those oxygen producing organisms, like the plants, are using carbon dioxide produced by the animals and most microbes. The plants are feeding the animals and many microbes indirectly by dying and decomposing, and probably sometimes directly as well by being eaten. And the animals and many microbes are providing the plants with nutrients by dying and or decomposing dead organisms. This way the ecosystem remains self-sufficient. You've seen a lot of the Creeping Charlie already, 
So let's see what else there is to see in this sea of organisms. Apart from the creeping charlie, there is still some moss growing in the soil next to the glass, which are the other plants still in here. And there also seems to be quite some algae growth. Now let's look at some of the animals. I have to give a small disclaimer that if I haven't seen an animal for a while in this jar, it doesn't necessarily mean it's extinct. Most of the animals in this jar are burrowing animals, so they're quite difficult to see. And the inside of the glass is usually covered in water, making it difficult to see anything at all. Having said that, let's see what we can see. But wait, you see, I have to say one last thing. The rove beetle we've seen before will probably not be seen again. I haven't seen it in quite a while and I don't think it made it this far, but we'll see. Here we have some springtails. In earlier updates we saw some light colored elongated springtails. For whatever reason they seem to be extinct or at least not very abundant in this jar anymore. The springtail population seems to have been taken over since then by these tiny dark lobular springtails. Since I can't see them from really up close and usually only see their underside or ventral side if you want to be pedantic about it. It is a bit difficult to say which exact species it is. I can say that it is probably a springtail of the genus of Spintherinus. If you think that's a bit of a safe guess, it's probably one of these five species. What's interesting is that they appear to be the same species or a similar one to the springtails that can be found in the fruit fly jar. So it would seem, based on the sample size of two, which isn't a whole lot, that this species, whatever it is, does well in closed ecosystem. And that's rad! Since I didn't see any of these tiny black springtails in the first few months of this ecosystem's life, all the springtails you're seeing must have come from a very small initial population. Possibly from some individuals in the soil or on the plants gathered from outside. Or maybe even from an egg. In fact, there is a possibility that all the springtails you're seeing are females and genetically identical, as springtails can reproduce through parthenogenesis. This would basically mean that all the springtails in this jar are clones of one initial female. However, I think it's more likely that this population stems from a few initial individuals. Like I said earlier, they are feeding on dead organic matter, but also on algae growing throughout the jar. Let's watch some more of these nematodes. I mean, I have to keep you entertained even without the presence of boogie worms, right? Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed that. Let's move on to the isopods, also known as pillbugs, woodlice, slaters, potato bugs, doodle bugs, saw bugs, armadillo bugs, bow builders, butcher bows, butcher bows. Wait, I've done that already! In this jar, I've only seen common rough woodlice lately, with some interesting color variations as well. As you'll recall, we initially had three isopod species in this jar the Armadillidium vulgare. Philoskia muscorum and Porcelio scaber. I've never seen the Armadillidium vulgare anymore. I saw some Philoskia muscorum or common striped woodlice for quite some time until I stopped <coughs> paying attention for a while. Oops. I'm not so sure they're gone though. It's quite possible they're still here. And they for sure haven't been breeding as much as our next isopod species, the Porcelio scaber. The common rough woodlouse was the last species added to this ecosystem, but the easiest to find. I didn't bother to look up any imperial evidence for this, but I am certain from my own observations that these are by far the most common species of isopod in the Netherlands. I did find that they are the most common species of isopod in Australia, even though it's not native there. One of the reasons they're so abundant is because, well, they're not picky at all when it comes to their habitat. 
Of course, being basically land lobsters, they require somewhat of a humid environment. But they tolerate a wide range of humidity. They can even be found in quite dry places. Pretty much any environment is fine, as long as there is moist rotting plant material present, because they eat that. That is probably also the reason they are doing so well in this closed ecosystem. The humidity in this soil and on the glass varies from time to time. But they don't really care about that. And there's always moist rotting plant material present. Isn't that interesting? In a second I'll talk a bit more about the water cycle, but first let's also take a look at the millipede in this jar. I only ever deliberately put one millipede in this jar. Looking inside of the jar, we see more than one millipede though. This is probably due to millipede eggs being present in the soil when I started this jar. Or there could have been another millipede from the opposite sex in the soil and they could have procreated. They seem to have been doing really well in this ecosystem for the last three years. Even though they have a similar diet to the isopods, they don't seem to be outcompeting each other. This is possibly because the wood lice spend more time above ground and the millipedes more time below ground. I believe there is only one species of millipede present in this jar and I believe that species to be Omatoyulus sabulosus. They live mostly in high sand grounds and dunes in the Netherlands but are also very common in and around Amsterdam. This is probably because it lifted along with the dune sands used in construction. Pretty cool. This one seems to be headbanging. So, that covers most animals that can be seen with the naked eye. In most clips you saw up until this point, it seemed like the jar was soaking wet, but that's not always the case. Usually the glass is wet in the morning and late afternoon, but dry during the day. Usually the side facing the window is also the wetter side. Just so you haters will believe me, here's some visual proof that the jar is actually also sometimes not very moist on the glass, on the inside of the glass. So, there you go, haters, potatoes. <laughs> As this jar is completely airtight, it can't be watered. But it doesn't have to be, as no water can evaporate out of the system. Instead, water evaporates, condensates on the inside surfaces of the containers and on the plants, and slowly falls down again, in a way simulating the natural water cycle. So, for the past almost three years, this jar with the terrarium inside of it has been closed airtight. The plants have been growing and dying, the animals have been reproducing and dying for generations, and all the organisms in this jar have been working together to create a self-sustaining closed ecosystem. That's totally radical. Who knows how long this terrarium will continue to live and thrive for perhaps indefinitely. If you want to find out and you haven't already, well, you're going to have to subscribe. Thanks for watching and goodbye.